Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with veteran jazz saxophonist Vincent Herring. On the heels of a new 2017 CD called Hard Times, life is good for him and it is charting very well. He grew up in Hopkinsville, Kentucky and started playing saxophone at the age of 11 in school bands. He went on to play in the Military Academy Band at West Point and would work with Cedar Walton for more than 20 years. That led to gigs with the likes of Freddie Hubbard, Dizzy Gillespie, Louis Hayes, Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, and the Horace Silver Quintet. Over a career that has produced over 20 albums as a leader and about 250 plus as a sideman. This interview was a long time coming, so please get to know Vincent and dig this interview, my friends. Thank you very much for taking a minute out for me. I appreciate it. No, well, thank you for thinking of me. I've been a fan for a long time. I love this album. Every album that you have come out seems like it successively follows a very evolutionary path in your hmm. growth as a musician. This newest album, Hard Times, which is charting very well. Talk to me about why this album was called Hard Times and how you feel about it. You know, the title has originally started out just because I, I like that, that particular song. Just by chance... I played the very last concert with David Fathead Newman. And so that was the original thing, you know. But then as I started playing it live on gigs and, and just talking about what hard times are for me and for, for everyone, it's just looking at the current political climate. And uh, this is, uh, you know, it's like we're almost at a, at, a, at a war and we don't even know it. You know, the things that are going on and the restructuring of, attempted restructuring of society and societal norms. Uh, it's really hard times. And if you're in tune at all politically, you know exactly what I mean. Um, and, you know, that's, that's really what that was about. Uh, the, the other songs that are chosen, they're just songs that were, um, rich in my childhood that I enjoyed so much, you know, like, uh, Good Morning Heartache. Um, I'm, I'm a, you know, a child in the 70s and, and grew up with that Diana Ross, late Saints the Blues. You know, of course, later I, um, you know, um, learned Billie Holiday's uh, original versions and things like that. But, but, you know, I grew up with that. And John Handy's hard work, you know, that was a signature piece for me when I was starting to play saxophone. Really enjoyed that, that a lot. And that's how those particular things came about. How important in this current political climate with the need for art to be voice is it for us to talk about and to have music as an antidote for what's going on? You know, I'm not ex exactly sure how I would define the role, but, but a, a few things that are taking place. One is I'm surprised at the level of discourse and disharmony that's happening that people aren't in the streets just rioting and protesting every day. And then I kind of realize, I say, what's happening? You know, people are on Facebook and other social media stations, and they're venting. They're, they're, they're talking how tough and mean they are and how terrible this is and awful this is and like Hitler and this. But, you know, they're venting. And because they're venting there, they're not out in the streets. It's really, it's really interesting. And as far as the art, you know, I, I never really thought about it like that. It's just an, an, an expression of uh, where, where I'm at, where I feel, and how it's affecting me. And I think um, if society is a, uh, decides to embrace that and take it on as any kind of uh, theme or anthem, then that's uh, then beautiful. I'm glad it would, would serve that purpose. But um, you know, I, 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 I'm, I certainly don't uh, have a pulse on knowing uh, where that would fall. So I don't know, what, you know, where I, where that would fall in, 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 into society like that. But but um, I, I hope I hope to think it would make some kind of an impact. And if we look at uh, protest themes throughout history, they've meant different things. But like I said, we have a, a new twist in the wind which is um, social media. Like I say, people have been there forever. You know, imagine if uh, during the civil civil rights movement, if people weren't in the streets protesting, if people were sitting comfortably in their homes, Facebooking how terrible this is and how awful this is. <laughs> it's a different world. Yeah. So, uh, 
You know, it's uh, there are new new dimensions in, in in our in our life that we have to adjust to, and so I don't see, you know, how how things fit because nothing is normal like it was. Absolutely, those are great thoughts. I, let me ask you this: How does a kid from Hopkinsville, Kentucky, grow up to become a jazz musician of your stature? Okay, well, first of all, my parents were divorced when I was three years old, and and I moved with my mother to California, you know, and I would spend some summers in in Kentucky. And, you know, at some point when I became a a father and, and realized how much I had to offer my children and, and what I really meant to them in their lives, I got mad. I said to my mom, I said, you know, this is, I was really short because you got divorced so early, blah, blah, blah. She said, if it wasn't for me, you would be a farmer. And I, and I said, stop me right in my tracks. And I was like, she's probably right. <laughs> you know, my, my um, dad, there's certainly nothing wrong with farming, but um, but you just have a another level of exposure to uh, not only the arts, but um, uh, have opportunities to uh, participate with musicians uh, uh, and on a high level, you know, and so... Um, uh, so I was very fortunate to be brought up in Northern California, where there was uh, some exposure to jazz, and, and also um, I'll point out that uh, I went to a public school, and then the public school system uh, in California at that time in Northern California they had it was a rich uh, inventory of instruments for you to choose from. So you just picked an instrument, and, and away you were off. So it was, it was great. So how important was it for you to play in the uh, military academy band at West Point? How much did you grow from that? I think uh, my growth there was as a person and maturity and more so than it was as a musician. It was, uh, as you can imagine, a very disciplined situation where, uh, you know, you had to answer to to your to the demands that were at hand. And so we would have like 7 a.m. practices, and we would run through all kinds of music. It helped, helped to develop my musicianship uh, more. And there were some great musicians in that in the uh, band, you know, some people that are on the scene now. Um, Doug Lawrence, who's a tenor saxophone player, he's like the main soloist with the bass orchestra. Jim Chirillo, I don't see him around as much anymore. Uh, James Kamak, there was a bass player with Ma Jamal for 20, 25 years or so. Um, there were some excellent musicians, and that was uh, the main reason I ended up doing that is I wanted to get to the East Coast, where I was from California, and not necessarily a man of many means, but certainly um, uh, winning that spot in the uh, in that West Point band would get me to the West, get me to the East Coast, and uh, would start me on my way. So you had a long relationship with Peter Walton. How important was that relationship for you? What did he give you that was so important over the years? Wow. Okay. Well, you know, first of all, it's a, it's really a, a progressive stance. Before I was even ready to play with Cedar, there was um, people that I had to play with that, that got me ready for that. And, and to give you an example of what I mean, the first time I played with Cedar Walton, we did a week at the Vanguard, and when it was over, he said to me, uh, he said, well, you're not quite ready, and, uh, but, uh, but keep working on stuff, and I'll call you again one day. You know, and that was pretty deflating, you know, to a young up and coming musician. It was pretty deflating. But you know what? He was absolutely right. And by the time he called me again a few years later, I was I was ready and could make a a real contribution, uh, a musical contribution to the band, and you know, and enjoy being there. And and it became a very uh, rewarding experience for me, uh, being able to interpret Cedar's music and to uh, play with the different musicians I played with um, helped to uh, better my musicianship by by uh, being able to play with those people and, and to develop myself and to find my, my spacing and my time and my feeling in different musical settings. Over the years, too, along with Cedar, you've played with so many folks. I mean, you've... Uh, you know, Freddie Hubbard, Dizzy Gillespie, L Louis Hayes, and Art Blakey. It goes on and on and on. So I want to know this from these folks. There's so many of them. But what did they give you that helped you be a teacher? Because obviously 
by osmosis, they were just who they were, but they taught you. And they gave you something that you teach to others. What is that? Um, probably the first real influence beyond music and, and, and life, I think, that helped me become a, a better teacher and a better person was uh, Matt Adderley. My relationship with Matt was uh, more like a mentor or um, almost a father-son relationship. And so, you know, he made me aware of so many things not, not outside of music. You know, like, for instance, just when we would have conversations, you know, my diction was so bad that uh, I would say things like, oh, he hurt my feelings, you know, and Matt would say, what? You know, and it would make me aware of... Uh, of how uh, how I was talking, you know, and he would say feelings. There's a difference between feelings and feelings, you know, and uh, l little things like that I wasn't aware of, and and also how he dealt with the business, you know, how he dealt with people, you know, how he wouldn't fire some people or or, or why he chose to let someone go, you know, it was, it, there were many lessons learned, and. You know, and and uh, like I say, it's, it, it's like building blocks. You know, I, it's not like one person out, out to say, oh, to show me everything. No, it was like if you're listening and you're watching and you're paying attention, there's so many life lessons around all of those people, about around anyone that's lived long enough, you know. Like, for instance, I, I got a chance to see some different sides of Freddie Hubbard that, that most people did not. And I wasn't in his band. I just did a few gigs and I did a couple of records and, and we would, and he would call me sometimes in the middle of the night and just, uh, and just talk, you know. It was interesting for me because uh, to me, you know, Freddie Hubbard is an amazing musician and it was head and shoulders above, you know, everybody around him. And to have some of the conversations I had with him was, uh, very um, uh, enlightening and uh, gave me an idea of, of, of some things about music and uh, and how to develop yourself. So after all of these years, you have over 20 albums as a leader, 250 plus as a side man. You've been all over the world. How do you feel about your career? Are you happy with how things have worked? As you you know go through this, I see different things in business. And that's, my career certainly could be in a, in a better place and it's like you playing 10 times better than you did at the age of 19 but you know it's like but the way the industry is they want to give 19 year olds you know uh, uh more attention <laughs> and it's uh it's it, it's not just in music i mean you see it in, in other things as well you know i can't say that i'm dissatisfied i could certainly be uh in a better position and I'm always working to uh, develop my uh, career even more and uh, I definitely feel like I have something to say and I've got a new band that I'm working with that is uh, tremendous and it's inspiring to me it's inspiring to uh, people who, who have a chance to hear the band as well so um, that's what I'm dealing with now and I can only um, take advantage of things as they happen and try to present my music the best I can and continue to write and learn music the industry is like, this is new, this is shiny. <laughs> I don't know if you're into sports at all, but um, I was having a conversation with my son about um, uh, a basketball player named LeBron James, and he has had such an unbelievable career that people don't even, don't really notice him. I mean, it's like, you know, like the other night, uh, uh, Kevin Durant, who's another outstanding uh, player, had this amazing numbers, career numbers, and we're saying LeBron's doing that almost every night. Uh, so the uh, industry kind of comes complacent, and he's not shiny new anymore. And, uh, and, and you know, I, I heard older musicians say these kind of things when I was younger, and I actually see it. You know, I see it happening. You know, like I say, only thing you could do is try to present music in the highest uh, level that you can and hope that uh, the industry uh, uh, embraces it and, and, and becomes more curious and uh, seeks uh, opportunity to, to have you express yourself. You know, the irony or the catch-22 of that is, is that if LeBron did go away, the NBA would not be able to hold itself up. <laughs> they, they stand so tall on his shoulders. Yeah, right. there's a level, and it's the same thing with the old guard. Even when Art Blakey was releasing albums later, right. like, right. just because... He was that guy that had that much mileage. He was keeping the vehicle of jazz 
going in mm-hmm. the right direction, which is what LeBron and all of these guys do. But, yeah, mm-hmm. every night I've, I've thought about that. My son's actually getting more and more into basketball, and we were watching highlights, and I've always kept an eye on him from when he started in Cleveland to Miami to coming back to winning a championship and just all of the – especially this year with the way the team's been reorganized. And when you're that big, you can reorganize an organization around you because you want a ring. And, right. uh, you know, so anyway, it's, it's ironic. It's weird. The business is weird and getting weirder. Uh-huh. It always <laughs> is. That's a guarantee. Yeah. Let me ask you a generic question. Why do you love jazz? You've dedicated your life to it. Just simply put, why do you love it? Well, first of all, it's, uh, it's just who I am. It's always been there. You know, I grew up with it. And it's and it's not like a slice of cake. Yeah, it's just it's just everything to me. Um, uh, I don't even think about why I love it. You know, listen, I, I, there's some that I passionately hate, <laughs> but um, no, I just uh, when things are right, uh, e- even as a, a listener, as a spectator, you know, when when you have great compositions and great players that are able to express themselves on, and through music, so well, it's just it's just very moving to me, and it's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a person who thinks that uh, uh, music, music education, uh, jazz education is important because I want for other people to have an opportunity to see, hear, and feel passionately about the music the way I do. And I think this comes with uh, an appreciation of uh, the musicianship. And when you study music, you hear it a little bit different. Sometimes you hear it as a snob, but um, but you can also feel very passionately uh, about um, about things as they're developing. And so I just I just love jazz, and I and I think it's so much fun. And I think it's so much. Uh, I just think it's amazing. And, and but it's kind of like uh, uh, the other day. Um, I shared a a uh, a tweet of a picture, which was the uh, GOP uh, logo uh, with the elephant, and it had the elephant trunk under the dress of a of a, of a woman. You know, it was like meant to be a joke. And and the guy, one guy that I sent it to, uh, not a young kid, but one of my son's friends, not very enlightened. He didn't get it. And I thought, you know what? This is this is like the music that I play. Some people just don't get it. And if you, and in that, that particular case, if you're not following world events and or not in tune, he's he, he's someone that's like anything about any sport. He knows inside and out. But you know, but uh, politics or just world events, he was really in the dark about. It. And so yeah, it's kind of like jazz. You know, some people just don't get the joke. Don't get it. You know, but um, uh, if they're more enlightened, uh, they have a, a great chance of getting it. You know, um, uh, like, you know, that's really the best way I can tell it. So for me, like I say, it's just like, yeah, I just when it's great, I really just love it very much. Beautiful. Let me ask you this. Everyone has a version of you, your family, your friends, your fans. But when you wake up, when you're Vincent, you wake up and you face the world. Who do you think you are? Hmm. Never, uh, never thought about about it like that. Uh, I'm, I'm just a guy that's trying to find my way through life. Um, you know, not perfect person, but try to be perfect, but I'm certainly not. And uh, I work on my music every day, and uh, that that part is consistent. I'm just trying to be a, a good person. You know, there are times when I fail at that, but. Uh, I want to be a um, a good person and, uh, and do something um, expressive and make my mark in the world. I think you're doing that. Vincent, thank you again. It's been a long time coming, but it's been a pleasure to speak with you. Good luck on the album, and hopefully we'll see you swing through Kansas City. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, Kentucky, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Vincent for his cool, his patience, and that time. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends.
Leon Jez.